Good morning. How are you doing today? Well, thank you for choosing First Baptist Church Millington to worship with today, and we're so excited to have you here. If you did not notice, today is a special day. It was Fresh Start Sunday, but I want to kind of encourage you with this. If you miss Life Group today, it is not too late to jump in. It's never too late to be a part of a small group here at our church. And Life Group is a wonderful way to be able to walk through life uh, with people so that when you're going through something at your home or in your personal life or in, you know, trying to struggle through things with your family, like there are people there that will pray with you. There are people there that will help grow with you. And that fits into who we are as a church. You know, our mission statement is that we exist to glorify God by surrendering, surrendering to Him and the growth of His kingdom. And one way we do that is by being a part of things like Life Group and being a part of things like Refuel Groups. This past week, we, we kicked off Refuel Groups, and it's definitely not too late to be a part of those small groups as well. We'd love to have you join us in those. Another opportunity, if you're a mom in the room or a grandmother or a lady, uh, today from four to six, we have the nest. Uh, the nest is... A wonderful opportunity to be able to pray for your families, be able to pray for uh, your children and those that are there with you. And if you've never come to that, it is a super cool thing, or at least I've been told because I've never been there. Um, but I've heard my wife speak about that and so many other ladies. And uh, it's, uh, tonight's going to be an aw awesome time to be able to just kind of plug in and just kind of to test the waters and see, is this a place that I can leave feeling equipped and encouraged? This is a place that I can leave and say, hey, you know, the Lord is using this and he can use this in my life. Another thing that I want to bring to your t attention is uh, with MPAA, if you're musically talented, gifted, or you have an, a niece, a nephew, a grandchild, or uh, a child prodigy, and you want them to be able to grow in that, or they've never picked up an instrument before. MPAA has an opportunity for you. The Millington Performing Arts uh, there, uh, the Arts Academy is something that Davis is leading tremendously in our church, and it continues to grow every single semester. But this semester, sign-ups end today. So it's an opportunity for, for you to be able to sign up. And if you're going to do that and you've been on the fence or you've forgotten, here is your reminder that today is your last day to be able to sign up. Also, if you're a guest today and today's your first time or you've been here for a million times and you've never filled out this card, uh, this is our Connect card. This is just so uh, we can connect with you. We believe that every person matters, every soul is important, and we want to just be able to connect with you about the things that are going on in the life of our church and hopefully be able to pray for you for the things that are going on in your life. And we'd love for you to fill one of those out and return that in our offering boxes or take it to the Connect desk. We've got a small gift for you we'd like to give you. And we'd just love to know who you are and be able to connect with you on a personal level. Also, this week, things begin to change for many people in the room. This week is when schools start back, right? We have a lot of people that are uh, beginning back in the classroom this coming week. And what I want to do really quickly is if you're a teacher or you're an administrator or you're involved on a school campus, uh, will you just stand for a second for us to be able to kind of put a face? Because we know that tomorrow and the rest of this semester and year, you're going to need our prayers. So will you stand for just a second so we can put a face with the name? Yeah. You can stay standing for just a moment because we're about to pray for y'all. Uh, I look back at teachers and influencers in my life, and I'm very grateful. You are true heroes, and we're so thankful for what you do. If you're a student, if you're in here and you're going to kindergarten to, through like 32nd grade, and uh, you're going to school, and you start back soon, will you just stand? We want to be able to put a face with that name as well, and we're going to just pray over everybody in the room, all right? Awesome. Really quickly, we're just going to pray for you and over you, and we're going to jump into some more worship. Lord, thank you for today, and just thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you, a risen Savior and a mighty Lord. Lord, we pray for those that are here today, that are, that are going to be this week, be, begin lesson planning and begin teaching and begin uh, being that intermediary, uh, in, intermediary for people and going before them in the classroom, but also to, on, on, on their behalf to you.
these teachers and these faculties and, the, and these administrators as they pray for those students and pray for those families. They're in such a unique spot where we pray just a, uh, just a, a calmness from you, a peace and a joy from you, Lord, and we are so thankful that you have called people to invest in the lives of individuals in that way. For those that are in this room that are going to go back, and they're going to be the, the ones that are learning. They're the students. Lord, I pray that they will recognize that what they put in is what they often get out. Lord, I pray that they will realize that learning and, and growing and uh, maturing and education and spiritually and all those things, that it is worthy, that it's a worthy cause. Lord, I pray that you will surround them with godly friends, with godly influences, with godly teachers. Lord, I pray that this year will be a year that pushes them closer to you, not a year that they find themselves falling further away. For those that are in this room that are, that are traveling or that are moving into a new stage of life, of going to college or their master's or something like that, Lord, I pray that uh, they will find people that will encourage and equip them to pursue you intimately every single day. And Lord, also I pray for those parents of those in this room that they're in the new stage of life, whether that is a new student, a new child in school, or a new class, or new classroom, or new teachers, or new calling, or whatever that may be. I pray that you allow them to be a source of encouragement. And Lord, I pray that they will find that in their encouragement and their joy and their hope in you. And Lord, most of all, we pray today as we worship. And Lord, I pray that you, it will be a, a dose of being able to see your goodness and your kindness and your favor in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will, I'm going to turn and ask you to stand in honor and recognition of such an awesome thing as we jump into some baptisms. Good morning, church family. Thank you, Andrew. One of the things that Andrew prayed over is the excitement and the joy that we get to have in the Lord. And one of those things is, is baptism. But the thing that happens before that, salvation, the, the accepting of Jesus into your heart, the accepting of Jesus into your life, knowing that Jesus is the only way that you can be saved. And we have two coming today. Mr. Owen Rosencrantz is our first, who's already accepted the Lord, already accepted the Lord of his life. And today he wants to make that public, a public profession that Jesus is the Lord of his life. And so, Owen, is it your public profession that Jesus is the Lord of your life? Yes. Well, based upon that public profession, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Also this morning, we have uh, Jackson Pennington coming. And Jackson's family actually just joined the church last Sunday. And uh, his, his mom and dad, and it is an honor to be able to come up here and to tell the testimony of Jackson who was saved last year as he was coming to church here. And uh, just an exciting and awesome, wonderful opportunity that we have. He has already said, hey, I want to do whatever I can in the church. I want to start serving. I want to start helping with youth uh, baseball. And so just somebody that's willing to just come and serve. But this morning today, Jackson, is it your public profession that Jesus is the Lord of your life? Well, based upon that public profession, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Church family, we saw two wonderful outward testimonies of what's already happened inwardly. Maybe someone in this room today has already accepted the Lord, already accepted Jesus as their Lord, and they've never done that publicly. Today can be the day that you can come forward and we can talk about that. We can have a day ready for you to do that as well. Church family, will you pray with me? God, I thank you today. I thank you for again, like I said, an opportunity that we have to worship you. I thank you for the breath in our lungs or that we can use that to boldly proclaim you as Christ. Lord, that every fiber of our being, every, everything that we put our hope, our faith and trust in is you, God. And we rest in that today. Lord, you are perfect wonderful, beautiful, God, and we just worship you today. Pray that all other distractions are, are taken away, that all other things are put away besides you, God, in this place. We love you, we praise you, and thank you for all that you do for us. In your name, amen. Well, good morning, church. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Psalm 23, verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, 
and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's good to be in the fellowship of the Lord this morning. Let's lift our voices to it. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. I got
For no man can lay a foundation other than it's been laid is Jesus Christ. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled?
that it has our sins they are many his mercy is more my wife's in the nursery today so I can share this story she won't watch it till later in the week um, so I won't get in trouble right after the service but later um, yesterday I was with my girls it was raining outside we were playing in the rain I was hoping for a hallmark moment but when the door opened my two-year-old Lottie ran out in her underwear um, and those lasted a few minutes and then the whole neighborhood saw all that God gave her. But um, in that moment, Tilly brought me a flower. She wanted to give to her mom. She picked uh, one of the flowers we had in the yard and she brought me a flower and she said, Dad, this flower smells delightful. And that caused me to look up and not worry about that the rain had stopped all the things I wanted to get done, but to look up at all the things that God gave me that I didn't deserve. And it reminded me of these words, my sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. His grace is sufficient for me. And it caused me, the little flower reminded me that God, you've given me so much more than I deserve. So let's sing that one more time before our pastor comes. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. My sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Let's sing that chorus one last time, church. Praise the Lord. thank you for the sweet reminders and just the day to day that your mercy is more than we deserve. They're new each and every morning. Your grace is sufficient for me. So Lord, as we read from Psalm 23 today, you said your psalmist wrote in that Psalm that even though if we're in the valley of the shadow of death, if we're in the presence of our enemies, Lord, you protect us. You go before us. Lord, even if we're on the mountaintop of victory, you're there. And Lord, surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives and we can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So Lord, today as your people, help us to be in sweet, sweet fellowship, 
not in ourselves, but in you. And help us to dwell not only in this building, but dwell in the Holy Spirit and the fellowship that it brings. Thank you for your church. Thank you for going before us. Thank you for the model that you gave us through Jesus and for his sweet, sweet sacrifice and his victory over death. Lord, we love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. Please be seated. Good morning, church. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. If you're visiting with us, we are reading through the Bible in chronological order. And so uh, the books of the Bible are not necessarily in order in which the events took place. So we're reading it from beginning to end in the order of the events that took place in time in chronological order. And so we made our way to Acts. In our reading this week, we'll be concluding the Gospels over the next two days, reading the resurrection and the ascension, the final words, the resurrection appearances and the final words of Jesus to his disciples. And then on Wednesday, we'll be reading Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. And I invite everyone to join with us in in reading. Uh, You can go to our website and see uh, the reading plan for each day. Also, they're posted throughout the hallways of the church. Just take a photo of it and you'll have uh, what we'll be reading in the days ahead. So as we go from the Gospels to the book of Acts, we go from the Gospel era to the church era. And so today we begin the church era. Era. And I know that in life group this morning, you studied uh, from the first six chapters of Acts, some in Acts chapter one, some in chapter two, and some in chapter six. And I want to dive in and dwell on a text in chapter two today. The title of the message is The Church That God Grows. I have preached this text once before as your pastor with the exact same title. And every time I preach this text, it is an appropriate title because God is telling us in Acts chapter 2, not only how a church can grow, because it can grow many different ways, man can do things to grow, I can get this church to grow rapidly, I just have to offer $100 to everyone that comes. All right, and attendance will go up, all right? That will work, but that's not God's way for a church to grow. And so the church that God grows is one that he is doing the work. He is growing. He is reaching people. He is saving people. He is leading people to be baptized. He is leading people to become part of the church family. So we see in Acts chapter 1, the the disciples and the 120 are praying for the Holy Spirit to come. And at the beginning of chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes and And uh, Peter preaches the message at Pentecost. And at the end of that message, we learn that 3,000 people from one sermon were saved. I'm praying for the same today. How about that? No. Uh, There's not even 3,000 people in the room, okay? But 3,000 from one message repented of their sins and placed their faith in Jesus. Well, following that, it tells us what was the church like as it started? And I'm here to tell you today, the first church is a model for what we are to be here at Millington First Baptist Church. And it is the model for every church to be. And so, if you have found Acts chapter 2, please join me in standing for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read from verse 41 through verse 47. So then those who had received His Word were baptized And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together 
and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your perfect word. And we thank you for the testimony of the first church, the Jerusalem church. Lord God, that's a church you grew. And we ask that you would continue to grow Millington First Baptist. We thank you for the growth you've brought our way numerically and spiritually. And we pray for that growth to continue by your grace. Grow your church your way. Help us to be faithful to what you've called us to do and who you've called us to be. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. In the text, we find multiple positive descriptions of this first church that are to be descriptions of Millington First Baptist. And if you are to, if you're from out of state and you attend another church or a member of another church, the same descriptions ought to be true of the church you are plugged into, that, that you belong to in another state, because this is what every church is to be like today. Number one, they were devoted. They were not apathetic. They were not complacent. They were devoted. If you're going to do anything, don't do it halfway. If you're going to do anything, be all in. And if there's ever a cause to be all in for, it is representing Jesus Christ here on planet Earth. That is worth being all in about. Here in this, in this very first portion of the text, we see that they were devoted to the Lord and His church. Now, you might say, well, Pastor, I can be devoted to God and not to His church. Not according to the Bible. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the habit of some. But then it says, when you assemble, which we're doing today, right? Encourage one another as you see the day drawing near. So you, are, you have a ministry as you're here today. You say, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a specific role. Encourage the saints. Encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ. You have today by your attendance, and may you use your words to do the same. We're commanded to do that, and we have to be together. We have to be assembling to do that, okay? So you are to be faithful to the local church. Now, you also need to realize that the church is the bride of the Lord Jesus. So picture the marriage relationship. He's the groom, and we as the church are the bride. So when someone is very critical and pessimistic and negative about the church they attend anywhere in this world, they are criticizing what Jesus loves. I don't know about you, but I, I, I don't want you walking around criticizing my wife. Okay? Jesus don't, don't want you criticizing his either. And that's the picture. He's the groom and the church is his bride. And so someone can't say, I love Jesus. I can't stand the church. What you're saying is you can't stand what he loves. Are y'all with me? Amen. This is important. A follower of Jesus Christ will not just be attending a local church, they will be magnifying the effectiveness of the local church to the world. They will be serving, they will sh be shining the light of Jesus, they will be encouraging the saints, they will be plugged into the local church for the glory of Jesus because Jesus' bride is the church. Verse 42, let's get to the text. I got excited and I hadn't even read verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves. To what? They weren't devoting themselves to fun and games, sorry. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. 
Now, why does it say that? Because at this time, the New Testament hasn't been written. And so what they need to know about the church, the apostles who were taught by the Lord Jesus and revealed truth by the Lord Jesus to share with the church is now teaching new information. I'm not to teach new information. The Bible's done. But at that time, the Bible wasn't done. The New Testament had not been written. And so the apostles were the mouthpiece for the Lord to speak new truth, not just old truth. And so the apostles' teaching was what they were devoted to, the truth of God, which is now basically what you read in the New Testament. They were devoted to it. Who were the apostles? The 11 faithful disciples. Judas is now out of the picture. Matthias in chapter 1 got appointed, so he's now the 12th apostle here. And they're teaching the church in, in gatherings and homes and all over the city of Jerusalem. They are teaching God's truth to the church. Let's remember there was 120 praying. Now there's 3,120 people in the church. So whenever someone says, I don't like large churches, they would not have liked Jerusalem, okay? There's 3,120 devoted followers of Jesus Christ that are seeking to be discipled. Woo! That'll get any pastor excited, okay? That's what's happening here. And the 12 apostles are are the pastoral staff. They're pouring into those 3,120. Now, second, it says, and they devoted themselves to fellowship in verse 42. Fellowship in the biblical terms does speak to spending time together. But it's not simply talking about what was the size of the fish you caught. Or how much did your necklace cost? It is talking about the Lord. It is holding one another accountable and fellowshipping with one another around the truth of God. And they were fellowshipping. They were devoted to being fed, and then they were devoted to discussing the things of God and learning from one another and encouraging one another. Chuck Swindoll wrote this, the result of pure fellowship is that people are involved in participating as partners in the lives of those around them. Do you realize why life group's so important? Because you're participating in partnering in ministry, in knowing each other. You're partnering in the lives of one another when you're in a life group together, living life together. There's a reason it's called that. That's a, there's a reason it's named life groups, because you live life together. You're praying for one another. You're encouraging one another. You're ministering to one another. You're holding one another accountable. If you're not in a life group, I encourage you, attend one next week, attend one next Sunday for your own spiritual benefit. Third, they were devoted to the breaking of the bread. Verse 42, they were continuing to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread. And in, and in the Greek, the, the article the is there. So it's the breaking of the bread, a significant bread. It's speaking of the unleavened bread symbolizing the, the pure body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's speaking of that bread taken at the Lord's Supper, we believe. And so here, they're devoted to being fed God's word, being taught it. They're devoted to fellowship with one another, and they're devoted to partaking of the Lord's Supper, remembering what Jesus has done for them in dying on the cross for their sins. Now, please understand who's devoted to this. Those that are born again. Those that are no longer Jews that have rejected Jesus, but Jews that have repented and believed in Jesus, and whether they could be Gentiles as well, but here in the church of Jerusalem, they were Jews, and they now realize Jesus is the Savior, the only one that could pay the price for their sin, and they had placed their faith in him. But not only that, they had also been baptized. Not only that, they had been added to the number according to verse 41. They had become part of the church family. Okay, and so now you've got people devoted to the Lord's Supper that have been saved and baptized and are part of the church. They're belonging, they're accountable to one another. And then fourth, they were devoted to prayer. Verse 42, they were continuing to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Henry Newman wrote, the prayer of the heart opens the eyes of our soul to the truth of ourselves, as well as to the truth of God. I like that. 
When's the last time you prayed and God gave you a different perspective? When's the last time you prayed for God to show so-and-so they were wrong and he showed you that you were wrong? God speaks to us in response to prayer. He opens the eyes of our soul to the truth of ourselves as well as to the truth of him. Never underestimate the power of prayer. A church only goes so far as they are willing to pray. Never underestimate the simplicity of prayer. Never underestimate the impact of persevering in prayer. The first church, they did not pray as an afterthought. They were devoted, devoted to prayer. I believe we here today, if I asked, do you pray, hands would go up. Would you say you're devoted to prayer? They were devoted to being fed God's word. Thank you for being here today to be fed. They were devoted to fellowship. Thank you for being here to encourage one another and be encouraged by others. They were devoted to the breaking of bread. Be faithful to attend when we partake of the Lord's Supper together. And they were devoted to prayer. The church that God grows can say yes to these things. It's what the first church did and God blessed in a great and mighty way. Number two now, they were in awe. Verse 43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Please notice that not everyone was performing miracles. Okay? Not everyone that had received the Holy Spirit was performing miracles. The apostles were performing miracles. Now, why does that matter? Jesus has just gone to heaven to be at the right hand of the Father, and the people are wondering who's really speaking the truth for Jesus. Well, it's the apostles that witnessed his resurrection, witnessed him in his resurrected state afterwards, and those that had the authority to perform these miracles and healings to say, hey, hey, we're the real deal. Listen to what we're saying. It separated them. It gave the, it gave the, the final nail, so to speak, that yes, they were speaking truth from God because of the power that God had given to them. They were performing miracles and signs, and the people were in awe of the greatness of God. May we never lose the awe of God. We don't have to see a physical lay hands, someone all of a sudden gets up that was crippled and can walk healing to see how great God is. We can see it that way, obviously. But may we not lose the awe of the greatness of God, of what he's done in our lives and in the life of this church, what he is doing and what he's going to do. God is good and mighty things he has done. Church, I don't know if, but I'm speaking in general terms, but I think 15 out of the last 17 Sundays, You've witnessed a baptism, multiple baptisms, virtually all of those Sundays as well. How does that happen if God's not working? It's the evidence of God taking what's dead and giving life, what's blind and giving sight, what's sick and bringing health. It's the transformation to evidence of God's work that only he can do as he changes and gives them a new heart. Woo! It's good to be a part of what God's doing. May we be in awe of him. Number three, they were unified. Verse 44, all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. Now I want you to think for a moment, if you're, if you're faithful to the local church, I want you to think for a moment about that person who says, I love Jesus, I just can't stand the church. And now read verse 44 again. They had all things in common. They were together and had all things in common. See, when you have 
When you have Christ at the center of who you are, you want to be with others that have Christ at the center of who they are. Does it mean we're sinless? Are we perfect? Absolutely not. We all know this. Don't let society define us differently than how Jesus defines us. He's the perfect one. He's the one that needs to be worshiped. He's the one worthy. We're not, but we gather because we're on the same team. Last time I checked, if a basketball team wants to win the championship, they get together and practice before. You know what this is? This is not the climax of your week. This is preparation time for your week. This is the launching pad for a great week of living your life for the glory of Jesus in this world. Amen? Amen. They were unified. Gene Mims wrote, ultimately the church is bound together not with creeds or confessions, not with programs and ministries, but with a unity produced by the Holy Spirit and driven by God's love for us and our love for him and one another. Church isn't unified because we set up a Bible study or a time to get together. The church is unified when people are filled with the Spirit of God, loving Him and loving one another. Is that you? We're bound to one another. The first church was continuing in unity because it came from within. They were devoted to the Lord and to His church. Four, they were generous. Verse 45, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Now, when it says they were sharing them with all, in the context, he's talking about those within the church. The church people were taking care of each other. This is something our lost world knows nothing of. It's so sad when someone that doesn't know the Lord and doesn't care for the church is is at the end of life and they have no support, they have no encouragement, they have no hope. It's so different than those that know the Lord and have a church family that loves loves them and prays for them and intercedes for them. Here, the first church, people were selling their property, they were selling their possessions in order to help others that were in need. Again, it's somebody in the church here. Other texts are talking about helping anyone and everyone in need, okay? So please realize that. We don't just help those within the church, but in this context, it's talking about the church taking care of the church. They were not selling their possessions because the the apostles gave them a guilt trip. They were not selling their possessions and property because they were told they were a bad Christian if they didn't give their property and sell it to help another. They gave because they wanted to. Because they knew that was, that was representing Jesus. Jesus had led them to do this. And I want you to notice that they were doing this ongoing. This wasn't like, hey, one, this one day we're going to sacrifice. No, this was happening day after day after day. People were selling property, selling possessions to help others in need. They were generous with what God had blessed them with. Why? They cared for one another. Do you care for those in your family? I'm willing to say that in your family, if you have a, you adults, you have a sibling or you have an aunt, uncle, and they have never abused your generosity and they ask for help, you're going to do your very best to help them. The only case where you might not is where they have burned you many times and you found out you were, you know, being abused, so to speak. But if they haven't done that, you're you're going to do everything you can to sacrifice to help them. Why is it any different in the church family? Just as it would be for your biological family, it ought to be for the church family, and it is. This is the reason we have a benevolent account, is to help people in need. This is the reason that many of you you find out about a need and and you, you give without even going through the church, without telling us about it, you just help that person. That's the way it ought to be, church. It's us caring one for another. Let us be generous people. 
5 they gathered. I've already addressed this one a little bit. I'll address it further in verse 46. Day by day continuing with one mind in the temple. So you got to realize these are Jews that were saved at Pentecost. The church is 3,120 Jews that are now Christians. So today we would call them Messianic Christians, okay? And so they still have that Jewish heritage. They still have been going to the temple day by day. But now they're, they're believers in Jesus. And so they got these, these conflicting patterns and habits in their life. And so now instead of going to the temple to pray for the Messiah to come, they go to the temple and they say, Jesus, I thank you that you're the Messiah that has come. And I pray for the Jews around me that know not you that you would save them right here in your house, the temple. You know, their prayer life changed. Their belief system changed, but they still went to the temple to pray day after day after day. Today, the Lord has called us to be faithful to the church. The church is not identical to the temple. We, the people of God, are the church, okay? This sanctuary is not the same as the temple, all right? So don't, don't make that mistake. But we are to gather, as I quoted earlier from Hebrews chapter 10, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. How do you do that? You got to be together to do that. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. So the writer of Hebrews is saying some have forsaken the gathering of God's people. How sad. And then he says, but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day drawing near. Right there, that's expected of you and I as believers in Jesus Christ. God expects us to, to worship him, to encourage one another by holding fast to our confession, to stimulate one another, to service we are to fulfill these expectations. So ask yourself, how am I doing? Are you, are you stimulating others to service and faithfulness in the Lord? John Ortberg wrote the following, I need to gather for worship because without it, I forget that I have a big God beside me and I live in fear. I need to worship because without it, I can forget his calling and begin to live in a spirit of self-preoccupation. I need to worship because without it, I lose a sense of wonder and gratitude and plod through life with blinders on. I need to worship because my natural tendency is towards self-reliance and stubborn independence, end quote. We need to worship because it is a reminder of the greatness of God and our need for Him. Amen. That's what we did as we sang. We worshiped through song a moment ago, telling God that we recognize how great He is. Though our sins be many, His mercy is more. Amen? Amen. We're thanking Him. We're reminding ourselves we are sinners, but His mercy his great, thank you, Lord, for your mercy. God made us communal people. Whether you're introverted or extroverted, God made you to be in community with other Christians. You don't have to be outspoken. You don't have to be out front. You don't have to be the life of the party. You don't have to be an extrovert to realize you need that community with other believers. I want to share a few verses with you. They talk about how we're to care for one another. We're to be in community with one another. Just as the first church they gathered, we are to gather and we're to care for each other. Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Romans 12, 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Romans 15, 7, accept one another. And it's not talking about accept sin. It's talking about accept one another's differences and preferences. 1 Corinthians 12, 25, the members may have the same care for one another. Galatians 5, 13, serve one another. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens. Ephesians 4, 2, showing tolerance for one another in love. Ephesians 4, 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as Jesus Christ has forgiven you. Philippians 2, 3, regard one another as more important than yourselves. 
1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage one another and build up one another. James 5.16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. 1 Peter 1.22, fervently love one another from the heart. 1 Peter 4.9, be hospitable to one another. 1 John 3.11, love one another. And there are many more in the book of Colossians and Hebrews talking about our care for one another. There is no way someone can be faithful to the Lord and say, I love Jesus, but I don't care for his church. All of those one another's are lived out through the local church. That's where you demonstrate those things, is your relationships with one another. Number six, they fellowshiped. And I've already covered this earlier, but it's mentioned in the text again, verse 46. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. What's that mean? They were t- having their meals, t- they're taking their meals and eating them together from house to house. They were spending time together. You know what? They didn't go out to the connect desk and sign a sheet to set up to go to someone else's house to eat a meal. That's not what happened. Those caring and loving and serving one another said, hey, why don't you come on over? We'd love to have you over to eat. It wasn't a church sign-up sheet is how that was arranged. It was arranged between God's people. Are y'all with me? Spend time with one another. Fellowship with one another. Eat meals together. Share your life with one another so they can be praying for you and you can be praying for them. So they can carry the burdens with you. Don't go through this alone. No one's meant to be isolated as a follower of Christ. Let the church be a blessing to you. Number seven, they praised God. Praising God and having favor with all the people. (laughs) They were praising God because God had saved their souls. Do you have the joy of Jesus? Does anyone hear you talk about the greatness of Jesus? They were talking about Jesus. They were praising God for his goodness. And notice what was happening. Because of their joy in Jesus, they were having favor with all the people. Now the reference to all the people are the people outside the church. They were finding favor with those that they were reaching with the gospel. They were finding favor in the workplace as they testified of what Jesus had done for them. Go to your workplace with joy in your heart, praising him, and allow God to shine his favor upon you in that workplace, in that school, in that environment in which you're in day after day and week after week. Be known for praising God. Verse 47, second part says, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, how was God adding to their number? We learn from Romans 10, how can they believe in whom they have not heard? Okay? They were placing faith in Jesus because the church of Jerusalem was telling them of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here it is. They were telling them that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. You cannot save yourself, but Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, has come, and he has bled and died to pay for your sin, to forgive you of your sin, to wipe your sin as far away from you as the east is from the west, to change your heart and make you new. And now if you'll confess Jesus as your Lord, your boss, your master, where you submit to his authority over your life, and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead on the third day, God will save you from your sin that's leading you to hell. He'll give you the free gift of eternal life. And when you breathe your last, you'll spend an eternity in heaven. And until then, you'll have abundant life here on earth. That's it. That's the gospel. And that's why the Lord was adding to their number day after day after day. And that's why the Lord has been adding to our number. And may God continue to do so as we continue to be faithful to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Students, your schools need Jesus. The students need to hear of Jesus. Praise God in your school. 
Adults, take the gospel to your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your family members, and praise God before them and testify of the gospel of Jesus Christ that changed you. That same gospel has the power to save them. They praised God. They were unified. They were magnified, and God multiplied them. Gene Mims in the Kingdom Focus Church wrote this. No matter how different they are on the surface, healthy churches share a number of key characteristics. They're filled with people on fire for Christ who put selfishness, politics, and personal agendas aside to the glory of God and His purpose. They give generously, evangelize tirelessly, and teach truthfully. They are a joy and a blessing to every member and visitor and a shining beacon in the communities they so faithfully serve, end quote. May that always describe Millington First Baptist. Amen? Amen. Let's be that church day after day after day. If you're here today looking for a Bible-anchored, Christ-centered, discipleship-driven, and unity-focused church, then search no longer, for God has brought you here. And I pray he'll reveal his will to you today and that you'll begin the process of becoming part of our church family today by joining this fellowship. We would love to have you become part of our family. We'd love to speak with you about the goodness of Jesus and what he's done for you and what he's doing in our lives here at Millington First Baptist. It starts with knowing Jesus. Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Do you realize you have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Do you realize Jesus, who knew no sin, went to the cross and bled and died to pay for your sin out of love for you? Abundant love and unconditional love, sacrificial love for you. That if you will now turn from your sin and turn to him and place your faith in him, confessing him as Lord and believing that he resurrected from the dead, he will save your soul. He will forgive you. He will make you new. You who need Jesus, in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. And when we begin to sing, would you come share with a pastor that you need Jesus? We would love to speak with you and counsel you and encourage you as you begin your journey with the Lord, as you become a child of God today. In just a moment when we stand and sing, you're going to have an opportunity. If you're a follower of Jesus but never been biblically baptized, you saw two today be biblically baptized, come and share that with us. And we'll set up a time, we'll counsel you and set up a time to baptize you in the days ahead. Maybe you know the Lord and you've been baptized but you have not joined a local church and the Lord's brought you here today. If he leads you to join, we want you to be faithful to him and obedient to him in doing so. If he's not leading you to join, we don't want you to. We want God to lead you here. And if he leads you here, may you yield to him and begin the process today to become part of the church family. You say, what's the process? We're going to pray with you. We're going to encourage you. We're going to hear your testimonies. And we're going to share with you what it means to be a member of the church. That's the process. And that can happen today. If you'll join me in standing, our team's going to make their way up. I'm going to lead in a word of prayer, and then we're going to begin to sing, and we're going to ask you to respond. Lord God, I pray that right now, Lord God, you would speak to the lost. You would convict them of their sin and show them your grace, your mercy, your goodness, that you shed your blood for them, Lord Jesus. And I pray you would save their souls today and lead them to not be ashamed of you, but to come share that with a pastor. I pray, Lord God, for those that need to be baptized, they'll come during this invitation time. I pray for those you're leading to become part of our church family. I pray you would lead them to move during this time. May you encourage them and may they be encouraged by what they've heard today. Holy Spirit, move on hearts. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.